Hello, good evening. Uh, Ash from London here again with another album ranking. And uh, tonight it's uh, an album ranking with a slight difference, a different approach. Um, I'm going to be ranking the albums of 10cc, but I'm only going to be ranking the albums of the original lineup, which is the, the time I was a fan. Uh, you may have noticed a lot of the rankings I do of bands from the early days. I didn't kind of like follow the bands to uh, much longer after a certain period, purely because I'd, I'd lost interest in them or the music wasn't doing it for me anymore. Um, and the, the same that, that happened with 10cc. I mean, they weren't terrible uh, in the later incarnation, but um, uh, I always thought the original was something really, really special and I really liked them. But um, uh, I'm, I'm not a completist. Um, I did follow the later um, uh, line of 10cc slightly. I, I didn't really particularly buy any of their albums. I saw them in concert later in the later years. They're still going along today, I think, with only one original member left. It's kind of more like a touring unit and on the nostalgia circuit. But um, the original lineup that uh, was around from seventy two to seventy six was um, was just the brilliant lineup for me. I just really loved them. Um, they uh, produced four really really good albums, which I'll be talking about uh, tonight. And um, for those of you who don't know, the kind of bands kind of split in half in seventy six. Uh, one half carried on at ten cc, um, brought in session musicians for one album, and then formed a uh, sort of proper band. With about five or six members all together and carried on, uh, while the other two um, went on as a duo, Le Godly and Cream, um, um, not as successful as uh, the um, the remaining members of 10CC, and they they also branched out into video production as well. But um, anyway, a bit about this original lineup, 10CC, um, a very very interesting band really, got a really interesting history and a really interesting prehistory as well. And they're formed in Stockport in the UK, which is uh, just a few miles south of Manchester. The four original members are all from the Manchester area, so technically a Manchester band, I think. It's a lot of well, quite a lot of people around the world don't realise are actually from Manchester. Um, the line it was um, Graham Goulman, um, Eric Stewart, Kevin Godley, and Lowell Cream, or Lowell Cream, I used to call him. I think it might be pronounced Cream. I'm not quite sure, but I'll call him Lowell Cream tonight. And uh, yeah, now they had before they before they formed Ten CC, they'd all all sort of like had successes in um, other bands and uh, as, as songwriters, performers, producers, and all, all kinds of things. They were kind of they're, they're quite solid careers before and getting involved with Ten CC. Uh, Goldman Stewart and Godley were all old schoolmates. Basically, they were um, all from uh, Jewish backgrounds, and they were sort of like involved in various music projects. Um, Lowell Cream came along. Um, they were uh, the three members were involved in a, a variety of bands in the sixties. Um, there was the, the Whirlwinds, the Mockingbirds, I think later Hot Legs, which were all kind of like a bit poppy. Uh, Eric Stewart, um, he was a member of a band called the Mindbenders, who um, along with Wayne uh, with Wayne Fontana as a singer, they were known as Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders, and they were a Manchester band. They were part of the British invasion of the sixties. It was spearheaded by the Beatles, and they actually had a US number one with a track called "The Game Is of Love." which was a big hit, and then Wayne Fontana left, so they just carried the name The Mindbenders, and uh, Eric Stewart, who was a guitarist, took over as lead singer as well, and they carried on for a few more years and had another hit with a song called uh, Groovy Kind of Love, uh, which was a cover song, I think, but um, and they did well, yeah, pretty well with that. Uh, the, um, the the way they got together was um, via a studio um I can't remember what the original name was, but it re the studio relocated to um, Stockport, which is just, like I say, south of Manchester, and um, became known as Strawberry Studios. It was named after Strawberry Fields Forever, the old Beatles song. And that's how they kind of got together, because the four of them, uh, they were so unique in the way that they were all singers, they were all multi-instrumentalists, they were all producers, and all songwriters. So four very talented guys together, which... Um, uh, Kind of, kind of was like was was um how they kind of got together really and uh, just really gelled and um originally started working as session musicians and working in the studio because the the working in Strawberry Studios ended up being okay kind of in house musicians and producers and everything and songwriters if needed so the, the studios uh, kind of took off and the people like Neil Sedaka were using him and uh, eventually Paul McCartney I think used it. And loads of local bands, and they 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 were, they were just in there. And if anyone with, with Neil Sedaka, for example, um, tends to see actually appeared uh, as the musicians on on his back on, on two of his albums. So um, that's how they got together. And then they decided one day, oh, to hell with this, we'll um, 
form a band on our own and then start doing our own stuff. So they, they formed in uh, Aztec CC in um, 1972 and uh, tried to sign to Apple Records, you know, the Beatles label, but got turned down by Apple. So um, had a bit of a think and then uh, wrote to Jonathan King, the, the old music and empresario who uh, started Genesis career off. And um, they sent him a copy of the recording of a song called Donna, which was kind of um, Frank Zappa inspired doo wop song that could, could have been sung by I don't know, uh, Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons or something but it was, a, it was a song they'd written themselves and Jonathan King just loved it so this is great, it's going to be a hit so he signed them um, to his, his own record label UK Records and that's how it all started uh, they were together like I say for just for four years and they produced four albums uh, there was a bit of a acrimonious split in 76 and I'll explain what happened then they did kind of get back together in 92 for an album called Meanwhile but uh, I was quite excited about that. I thought, oh, great, the original line of getting back together. But it um, didn't really happen the way I thought it was going to do. And it was still um, Goldman and Stewart uh, with uh, Godley and Cream just providing backing vocals. And I think Godley sang lead on one one track. And that was about it. They didn't write anything. They didn't really get involved with production or whatever. So um, that was a bit disappointing. But uh, anyway, I'm going to be talking about these uh, four great albums. The, um, all happened, okay, I got released when I was at school. And they were just one of the bands that everyone was into at school. And they have a kind of parallel career to Queen at the time. I was kind of thought, because I was into Queen at the time, and I was into 10CC, and there, there was something about them that I kind of thought, oh, they're kind of, kind of similar. They both, both groups were very successful with singles, and the singles charts, and with the albums. And they were very sort of innovative in um, the recording process as well. So um, anyway, let's... Talk about 10cc albums, shall we? Um, okay, I want to start off with uh, number four in this little ranking. And it's a 1975 release, and it's called the uh, original soundtrack. Uh, which is um, the one that really really took off for them, really. Because um, this features their most famous song, I'm Not In Love. Uh, which was a super smash hit single in the UK. It was number one for quite a while. I think it got to number one uh, in Australia as well, but it also broke them in the States as well. That was their big, uh, first big hit in the States. Uh, sleeve design by Hypnosis. Uh, it's a, quite, a, quite a nice little pencil drawing, actually. I it spreads out. Obviously a bit of influence from uh, the movie industry there. There's the centre. Another pencil drawing there. There, folks with the band. But yeah, Hypnosis did the design. The actual illustration, the pencil drawings by... Um, guy called Humphrey Ocean who's a contemporary fine artist and an interesting guy so he's also a musician and uh, played bass in um, the Blockheads, the Ian Drury, Ian Drury and the Blockheads and uh, I've got a, a little story about him actually, um, he's got quite a lot of paintings uh, well, in various galleries all over the place and I saw one of his paintings in um, National Pit Portrait Gallery in um, London and um, it's a portrait of uh, Philip Larkin, the, <laughs> the poet. And when I saw it, I thought, oh, it's a portrait of Eric Markham, the comedian. So uh, there we go. Anyway, that's, that's another story. But yeah, this, this was um, not a bad album, actually. It's, it is really good. Um, the other hit single off here was Life is a Minestrone. I didn't get to know one, which was a big hit. But it's very exciting. They've got a bit proggy on this because um, the, the, the album opens with a, a nine minute uh, mini opera. Called uh, One Night in Paris or Une Nuit à Paris, um, which has three parts. One Night in Paris, uh, the same night in Paris is part two. Part three is called Later the Same Night in Paris, which is all pretty, you know, pretty good fun. Um, there's some uh, other good stuff. Uh, the second sitting uh, for the Last Supper, which um, open side two, is pretty good as well. Uh, that that remained a bit of a stage favourite even in the after the split. And uh, got the tracks like Brand New Day, Flying Junk. Life as a Minestrone is quite a nice up tempo up tempo pop song. They were really good at writing really cool pop songs, really good hooks in them, good chord choruses, very memorable, you know, good length for a single. And uh, yeah, that was that. But um but yeah, it was um, their first release. Um, they'd left UK Records by this was this was their third album, they'd left for UK Records and signed a million pound deal with Mercury Records, so this was their first for a bigger label. And uh, yeah, so it was um one thing about Tennessee, they never had a number one album, but I think this got to number five or something. Got top ten anyway. So um, there you are. So nineteen seventy five, the original the original soundtrack is my number four album in this ten CC ranking. Okay, for number three in the ranking, I'm going back to the debut, the first album, 
10cc self-title from 73. This is the first one I bought. Uh, I was actually into the singles first. Um, I remember Donna coming out. Donna was the one I was talking about. Um, that the, the, they sent to Jonathan King. They released that as a single. That became their first hit. Got to number two in the charts. It's quite interesting. I think that's why people didn't connect them in Manchester because, uh, like I say, it had that kind of um, doo-wop kind of sound. They sang in very heavy American accents as well quite a lot of the time. A lot of the terminology in the songs around this this time was very American as well. Like the, the, um, the, um, particularly songs like uh, Rubber Bullets. Rubber Bullets was their... Um, Second hit single got to number one. It was their first big smash. Um, talking about the county jail and all that kind of stuff. And um, but it, it was really good. But like I say, it's really really great pop songs. Um, uh, I, I knew Lowell Cream was, was a graphic artist, and I always thought he, he actually painted that himself. Um, but it's not. It's done by a guy called uh, who did it? It was it was actually designed. The idea was by Lowell Cream, but uh, it was done by a guy called Chris Grayson, who was. Um, no, that's not typical of his work, actually. That's probably you know, not his. But he actually did the, I think it was a, the cover for the one of the Moody Blues albums, Days of Future Past. I think that was one of his. But uh, I always quite like that. It's quite, it's got a bit dirty over the years, but uh, I always quite like that. I bought it. The Tennessee were a John Peel favourite at the time as well, and uh, John Peel gets a gets a name check on the back of the album here. It says, "I'd love to hear a Ten CC album, John Peel." March 73, so there's a the back there, the picture of the, the band. And uh, yes, we've got, we've got some, uh, the, uh, actually the track listing is not in the right order on here, actually, on, on the cover. Can't remember what it opens with, as it mentioned on the, uh, the line, there's a song sheet inside here. Oh, Johnny, don't do it. No, wait a minute. Speed kills, rubber bullets, hospital songs, ships don't just disappear in the night, fresh air for my mama. I think Fresh Air for My Mama was an old song from the Hot Legs period that um, they rewrote. Uh, Rubber Bullets was a great song. I just loved that. That was a family favourite when I was a kid because I was like 13 when that came out and, uh, and um, my mum and dad were into it and uh, it was just really, really cool. Um, the, the other single off here, there was three hit singles off here. The other one was at The Dean and I, which was another American Eyes kind of sound. That was a really, really cool song. I really enjoyed that. Happy memories from my school days. Listening to these, actually, and listening to, on the on my little transistor radio when they're in the charts. And uh, yeah, it was just a really good start for them. There's some really good uh, pop hooks in there. Some great tracks. I just really loved it. Ten CC first album. And oh yeah, the one thing about this was the first time I'd ever heard swearing on a record. Nothing too nasty. Nothing like uh, you hear nowadays. But uh, actually, heard swearing on the not on any of the singles on some of the album tracks. So I thought, oh my gosh, what's going on here? This is uh, three years before punk rock. Okay, now then, where are we? Number two in my little four album rundown here, 10 CC, and that is their second release, Sheet Music from 1974, which is where they really started getting uh, creative. I think Kevin Godley said, well, we had an explosion of creativity. And um, this was the first one to feature a hypnosis sleeve as well, yeah, which is quite nicely, nicely. Um, set up there. I think, I'm not quite sure where that shot is. I've got a feeling, I should have researched it, but I obviously haven't. I've got a feeling it's in a, the foyer of a theatre. Because I know, um, after Strawberry Studios became very successful, and they got, got to the point where it was that busy, you know, tend to see themselves, couldn't get any booking time there. So they opened up a, another straw, um, Strawberry Studios called Strawberry Studios South, um, somewhere near London, or somewhere in Kent maybe. And I think it was in an old... Um, refurbished cinema and I've got a feeling that might be the same one but I could be totally wrong with that but uh, yeah this this was great um, I was a slightly um, it was slightly disappointing for them um, I, don't, I don't think it really took off in terms of the singles the, the first single off this the release was called The Worst Band in the World which I always thought was a bad decision to release that first and it was a, didn't hit wasn't a hit at all I mean because when you think they already had like um, three hit singles one of them were number one and then I was like, really, I said, all right, they're going to go huge. And then the, the release a single of Worst Band the World, it just didn't, didn't chart at all. It was a complete flop. They should have released the Wall Street Shuffle first, which they released later, and that was a hit. And uh, that's the track, that's the um, track that opens the album. Um, <coughs> Worst Band the World isn't a terrible song. It just doesn't work as a single, to be honest. Uh, they released uh, another single off this, uh, Silly Love, which opens side two, which is pretty good. But yes, it's just a great album. They've got loads of really interesting ideas and production. And they, there's a lot of cross-pollination with the songwriting as well because um, they, they do their own songs and they have the team up. Godling Kreml team up and then Stuart and Cream will team up and then 
Goulman and Godley and all over the place. And it's, it's, it's really exciting. There's a track on there called Clockwork Creep. It closes side one, which is a quite a uh, sort of like gloomy track about um, a, a, an, air, an airliner with a bomb on board, Clockwork bomb on board, which uh, crops up in a later song, I shall tell you about soon. Uh, that's kind of interesting. And the the, um, the the harmonies are coming in here. I mean, they got the vocal harmonies off to a, to a T. I'm not in love on the um, original soundtrack. Was that one with the multi layered harmonies and vocal harmonies? And this is where they kind of started with that. Um, just just really some really clever production. Um, so yeah, good good album. There's a, the back of the sleeve there. So yeah, um, what more can I say about this? It was oh well, yeah. It, 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 I, I told you about the. Um, how how busy it was getting at Strawberry Studios because this was recorded at the original Strawberry Studios. It was getting that busy um, that they had to record at night in the studio because it was busy during the day. And during the recording of this, uh, the daytime sessions in the studio were uh, all booked up by Paul McCartney, <laughs> who was he wasn't recording his own stuff there. He was doing an album for his brother, Mike McGear, who was in the Scaffold, the comedy band the Scaffold. So anyway, there we go. Ten CCs sheet music from that seventy four was number two in my. Uh, 10cc ranking here, which means number one is uh, Desert Island Time Again, one of my classic favourite albums. It's uh, from 76, How Dare You, with a, a great hypnosis sleeve. I just love the sleeve of this, it, it kind of tells a story. Um, front and back, so I'll, I'll, really cool. Hypnosis at their best, I think, one of their best, one of their best um, sleeves. But this, 10cc at their best as well, was just a superb album. Um, this, um, I was so pleased when this came out, and it was so sad. And then, of course, the same, later the same year, they kind of split up, because I was, I was thought, oh, they, you know, they've gone on to great things. I mean, both both Tennessee and, and Queen, I mean, Queen were huge by this point as well. They'd had their big hit the previous year with Bohemian Rhapsody, and they were just going through the, they were going stellar. And I thought Tennessee were going to do the same, but they kind of didn't really. Um, I mean, T Tennessee was still popular. I mean, when when they split and Tennessee carried on as a, as a two piece, and then later you know, formed with other members, it was still popular. I mean, they had another number one hit with um, Dreadlock Holiday, which I, I didn't quite like that that much, but they were still you know still um, crunching the numbers, as they say. But um, yeah, but this was just superb. I just love this when it came out. There's some some fantastic tracks on it. If I can uh, find the listen here. We are. Um, there's like a little little, little instrumental that um, opens up because there's really, some really inventive uh, production on this as well. And uh, it, uh, sometimes uh, I was kind of thinking, oh, it's a little bit gimmicky in parts, but uh, I can get over that. I mean, I felt the same with Dark Side of the Moon when, when the, the production on that. There's all little sound effects coming in here and there, and you know, very speed voices and all kinds of things. But it, it, it kind of it just really works because the songs are so good. The songs are really strong because you've got. Um, how, how dare you title track was as an instrumental opens up and then the lazy wage was a lovely song one of their underrated tracks um then uh, i want to rule the world which is a bit of a gloomy kind of comedy there's always a bit of comedy involved with uh, 10 cc as there is with queen really a lot of pastiche kind of stuff and then their um their masterpiece i'm mandy fly me now um, mentioned um uh, clockwork clockwork creep on the sheet music Album. There's an intro because uh, "I'm Manny Fly Me" is also about flying in, a, in an airplane that crashes, and uh, so there's a little bit of clockwork creep um, at the very beginning of it. You can just how that comes in. There's, there's also someone tuning a radio almost, um, but apparently that's only on the um, album version. On the on this album version, I think it's, it's edited out of the single version because that was released as a single. Uh, I can't remember if it was a big hit or not. It made the charts. I remember it, um, but it was a multi-piece. Um, um, you know, multi multi part tracks like the slow, the main part, then a fast bit in the middle, and then a conclusion at the end. Almost a little bit like Bohemian Rhapsody, where it's in different sections. Um, then you got um, Iceberg, which is a pretty cool song. Then the side two opens up with Art for Art's Sake, which was another another hit single off here, which is an Eric, Eric Stewart led song. Then you got uh, Rock and Roll Lullaby, which is probably one of the weaker songs on the track uh, on the album. Then a headroom and don't hang up at the end, which is a, it features that telephone thing at the end where it's a don't hang up. And the, the, whoever he's talking, to, the whole song is as if someone's talking to someone down the phone. And then they, they hang up on them at the end. You, know, you just hear the dial tone. But um, yeah, telephones are a running theme through this, of course. You can see um, 
like in the sleeve, like the story of the sleeve is great. You've got the businessman and always talking to his wife, who was at home drinking and drinking a whiskey or something there. Obviously having some kind of argument. He's in the office, and behind her in the car, this young couple getting out of the car, and it's the same young couple that's in the um, photograph on his desk. And on the back, um, there's um, some dirty old man in a call box phoning a um, air hostess, who could be the Mandy from the I'm Mandy Fly Me song. And um, behind him is the same couple there, uh, having, a, having a cuddle outside the phone box. And they're also on the TV. Where are we? On the TV there in the hotel room and uh, having a fight. So um, there's kind of a little story going on there. I don't know what it's all about. And everyone in the middle, everyone features there. Uh, there's like a it's like a hotel room. All the characters from the cover are in there and the band are in there as well. They're on these uh, phones. But sign of the times. I mean, uh, this is obviously pre-mobile phone. They're all in the old analog phones there with lots of cables everywhere so that's a, that's quite a nice shot that must have been taken and taken a while to set that up to get it all right and um, to make it look kind of natural but um yeah it was just just great great album the i'm mandy fly me and thing idea actually came from a poster um i can't remember what the uh, eric stewart said he saw it in, um, in an airport some poster for an american airline maybe in pan am or tibu away and it's uh, the actual line was I, i'm cindy fly me and he had a, a picture of the hostess but uh, apparently mandy sounded better for the song um and that that starts off with that bing and little bell you hear from before an announcement on on a plane which was uh, really cool actually when i saw them uh saw them in concert they actually started the show with that house lights went down you hear Bing! <laughs> That's the start of the show. Oh, wow. With an announcement. <laughs> Live on stage, 10cc. No, it wasn't like that, no. Uh, anyway, there you go. So, yeah. Classic album. One of my one of my favourite albums of the 70s. Um, 10cc, How Dare You. Um, just brilliant. Very underrated. It needs, it needs a, leads a, lot, a lot more love, this album, I think. It needs to be, it needs to be uh, categorised up there with the, with the Dark Side of the Moons and the, the Rumours and all those like, great albums of, uh, of the era. It just really, really, really is a good album. Okay, and that's it. That's my, um, that's my 10cc ranking. Uh, like I say, I have no, uh, don't totally dislike the later 10cc stuff. I, you just never, never did much for me. And because um, you recognise the years, they kind of came to a halt in 76 with this lineup. That was the year punk happened, and I got slightly distracted with punk rock. Oh, it's got something going on over there. So, and then ten cc for me were kind of like, you know, um, out of, out of the window, so we say. Okay, so um, that's that. Um, that's me for now. Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for being there as always, and um, more stuff coming soon. So um, stay tuned. Bye bye for now. <laughs>